Mars is a different sort of a problem. It's much, much harder. There is a fascination with space still amongst people. What's out there? And, and why is it there? And why are we here? And how did we get to be here? All those sorts of questions are all rolled up in this why space question. I had the opportunity to meet about half of the guys that walked on the moon during my career. Every single time, I mean, I, I was tongue-tied. One thing I, I was cautioned about was, do not ask Neil Armstrong about landing on the moon. <laughs> that, he, he didn't want to talk about landing on the moon. Other guys that have walked on the moon that, that are still around, there's only four of them right now that have walked on the moon. Still, out of the 12, there's only four left. They've seen the photos. They've read the history books but they haven't heard the stories. The Chinese Communist Party has been engaging for a long time in what you call space warfare, anti-satellite warfare and so on, which is one of the reasons why NASA is not allowed to work with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, one of the big discussions in this country is the future of space, especially when it comes to the role of NASA. When you have private industries, when you have militarization of space with countries like China, playing into this. And here to speak with us now is Al Bowers. He's an aerospace engineer and one of the former chief scientists at NASA. Al, it's a real pleasure to have you on Crossroads. Thanks for having me. And so just starting off, when you hear about, you know, people are questioning why space? We hear about China talking about mining the moon. We hear about anti-satellite weapons. We hear about SpaceX and, you know, commercial flights to space. Why space? What, what, what is the role of NASA? in all of this? NASA was originally set up as a purely civilian uh, agency. Much of the technology that got rolled into NASA, of course, came from military. Uh, a lot of ICBM uh, technology got rolled into the rockets that we used early on. And still, there's still some crosstalk between the military. But generally, when people come from the military to NASA, they, um, they, they actually change who they end up working for. And so um, we, we still think of ourselves as being primarily civilian, and uh, we don't have a whole lot of crosstalk between us and the military. Although we still, because we use a lot of their technology in a lot of places, we still talk a lot. Why space? Space is, in, in many ways, I, I was a kid that grew up in that era. I remember the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. Um, like they were yesterday. Um, the, the people who flew on those missions are my heroes. And growing up, that was just, it, it was just so amazing to think that we were actually doing this. Mm -hmm. um, during my career, uh, near the end of my career with NASA, I was down at Kennedy Space Center for a launch. And it was so amazing to watch this huge device lift off and it took about uh, five seconds from the time the, the rocket lifted off until we, we actually heard anything. Um, more than that, actually. But the amazing thing was, as we watched the rocket arcing over, and they were telling us how many miles downrange and what the altitude was and what the velocity was, the person I was standing next to, an, another NASA person, and we were both standing there with, you know, chills on on our on the back of our necks and on our arms. And he made the comment, "It is so amazing that human ingenuity can create something, and we can see it, and it's already in space." And and we we just both had that moment where we were just in awe of of what had just been done right in front of us, and there's it's just captivating. I, I look at the number of telescopes that get sold to kids, right? And, and they want to see the rings of Saturn and those, those kinds of things. It captivates the imagination just to, to think about what's out there and, and why is it there and why are we here and how did we get to be here? And the, all, all those sorts of questions are all rolled up in this why space question. Yeah, well, you know, there was a certain mystique to space go back to the 1950s and so on. Uh, you know, NASA had so, so much more mystique than it does now because when people first landed on the moon, that was 
significant. Now people are like, oh, we've been there, done that, why go back? And now you hear about it, we're moving into commercial industry. I'd say the view of space has changed somewhat. And people are now questioning, you know, what is the value of actually going back? What is the value of going to Mars? You know, NASA's of course working on these things, but in terms of kids looking at it, I would say the culture has changed. Do you feel this as well in terms of how kids look at these missions? Now there's some understanding of what's there. Absolutely, absolutely, Josh. The um, the the public perception of NASA, and, and part of this is um, the the agency. They're a bunch of technical nerds like myself. Okay, we have difficulty speaking to other people and trying to communicate what it is we do and why this works the way it does and why what we think is important and and we're problem solvers okay we we you give us a problem and you know we're off and running the the one of the hardest things is to unlearn something that you already know if you're already used to running in this direction it's hard to change direction or to change what, what it is you're doing and so for people who love space they they don't understand people who don't. It's, it's actually a, a difficult thing. And, and um, this is part of the reason you never want to go to a dinner party with one of us. Because <laughs> if you ask us this question, you know, for the next two and a half hours, that's all you're going to hear about. Uh, we, but the, there is a fascination with space still amongst people. And um, I'm friends with two Apollo astronauts. It blows my mind that these, these guys talk to me. But one of them is a really good friend, a very close friend. He lives here locally. And um, it, you stop and think about the things. He was standing at the console when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. He was one of the guys in the photographs of the mission control at that time. You can see his photo. He, he's standing there in the back. And he was one of the guys that was one of the support crew for the Apollo 11 mission. He, he was support crew for Apollo 8, Apollo 11, Apollo 13. He was on the group that tried to figure out how to get the square canisters into the round holes. That, that was a part of what he figured out in order to get those guys back safely. Those are the, solving those kind of problems, just, it, it, it's so incredibly cool. And just to think about what these people did, no one had ever done that before. And this was something I spent a lot of time working with with interns at our place. And the, the beautiful thing was they I, I, I when I first came to NASA, I myself was an intern and I had a mentor who walked me through the halls and introduced me to people. We still had two of the test pilots that flew the X-15 were there. I got to meet these guys. One of them, his office was 30 feet from my office and Friday afternoons he would come over and just tell stories. We, he, he would show up at about three o'clock in the afternoon. You just put away everything that you were doing. And he, he had these stories of flying the X-15 into space, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, and then landing on the lake bed out there at Edwards. And he was the guy that did that. That, that was just so mind blowing for me. And I always loved it when, when I had interns to introduce them to, to these people and, and what they knew and, for just to see the students interacting with these these people and they got to tell their stories again things that they the students had never heard before mm. and it's still a wild frontier out there and there's still so much we don't know and it to me it's just a fascinating problem and i i, I do understand that it costs a lot of money in order to be able to do these things and there are things that we could do better, but in many ways there still needs to be a place, an organization that makes mistakes for the first time and does things that, well, in hindsight, that wasn't such a great idea. And to try out new things, because every once in a while you find something, I mean, cell phones, right? The technology that comes from that is because we went to the moon. Those, and, and you think about the airliners people ride in, um, digital technology for, um, all of that was developed for Apollo. And 
the predecessor to that Gemini. And, and all those things were developed in order to be able to go to the moon. And now it's commonplace. And people take advantage of those things. They don't even realize that it's what they've got in their hand has that connection back to what they were doing before. Um, drive by wire, um, autonomous cars, uh, autopilots on aircraft. All of this stuff was developed because we went to the moon. Now, going back to, I think, when space had more mystique, right? You had Jules Verne. You had, uh, right? you know, it wasn't just space. It was cars. It was new forms of travel. It was the idea of the frontiers of the world. And right. I, it feels these days like there's always an answer now. You can jump on Google. You can jump online. Right. Answers come easy. There's the mystery in a lot of things is gone now. And people feel that they have general understandings of things. They don't want to look beyond those general understandings. But space now is kind of, you know, not the planet, but the last frontier, so to speak. It still has that mystique to it beyond, I think, the moon now. And I'm curious for you and your work, how is that viewed? Like, you know, when you, when you think about the work you do and you talk to other people who worked at NASA, right. how do you view it? How, how do you view your work? new discoveries all the time. I remember when um, Cassini was orbiting Saturn and we were getting the images back of what was going on in Saturn. And the largest moon around Saturn is Titan. And they had this real anomalous sort of odd thing that they were getting back in the data that the radar images that they were taking of the surface of this moon had these broad, flat areas. I mean, completely flat. And there was this misunderstanding of what they were looking at at first. And it quickly became apparent that there was actually liquid on the surface of Titan. There are seas on Titan, just like we have oceans here, except it's not liquid water. It's liquid methane. And there is literally a, a group of people right now who are trying to solve, in, in, in 2034, the plan is to actually launch a mission to go to Titan, to land on one of these seas. And there's several universities right now designing the boat that will end up on the seas of Titan in order to figure out how deep is the methane there, um, to, to map out the, the what it looks like underneath. It, it's so mind-blowing to think about this. And this is the only other place, by the way, that has liquid on the surface of a world in the solar system that we know of, other than the Earth. No other place in the, in, in the solar system, the universe that we know of, has a liquid on the surface. And it was a complete shock that this would happen when it, when it came up. Those kinds of things, when I, when I talked to my students, we're having this conversation about this idea, and several of them go, Mr. Bowers, where, what schools are those? Because they want to go and find the professor and apply there to help work on this problem, because it captures their imagination, that here's something new and unique that we didn't know before, and they want to be on the cutting edge of that. And yeah. it, as a utility, okay, what does that have as a value for us? Nothing right now. But it, until you actually go there and figure out what's going on, will we find new materials? Will we discover new processes in the way, along the way, that we can use here on Earth that will allow us to do something that we can't even imagine right now? And we don't know the answer to those questions until you get there. You know, what's interesting, and just thinking about this, it seems like part of the interest in space isn't so much an interest in answers. It's more like an interest in mysteries. That there's some, And there's something in that that does capture the imagination. And through capturing the imagination, I think lets us think outside the box. And NASA is a you know, is an organization, is designed to think outside the box, it seems. In many ways, that's true. We, we, we like to think of ourselves that way. Um, dur during my career, um, 37 years uh, working for the, the federal government, um, 
on the backs of the taxpayers, by the way. And, and that, it didn't occur to us every single day, but there were a lot of days where we were thinking about, is this really the best use of the money that we're, we're getting? Um, but along the way, you, you had this fascination with looking at something for the very first time. And this was something that I emphasized to the students that, that would be there with me at the time is, is that we are the very first ones in the history of the universe to see this, this problem, this data, this solution. And now it's our responsibility to put the, package this in such a way that other people will also know about it and understand it and, and can possibly take advantage of it or use it in, in what they're going to do. And so how do you write this paper so that people will understand what it is you did? And, and how do you couch it so that you can bring someone who doesn't have a background in what you do can understand what you've done? And how did you put the experiment together? And what were the things that you measured? And what were the uncertainties on that measurement that you got? And you have to describe all those things so that when you describe the final result of what you had, people have an idea of how good is that number? How good is that data? You, you intellectual honesty demands that you put that out so that people understand we didn't do a very good job on this one. And in fact, um, NASA, the history office at NASA has recently, uh, in the last 20 years or so, started publishing reports on the failures that we've had along the way. And what you imagine initially as a failure, we could learn a lot from those failures. Not necessarily not to do that again, but other things. Um, one of the ones that we, we stumbled into during my career was the seats on airliners. The seats on airliners are actually meant to deform and, and break in a certain way so that it will not injure the person and it minimizes the amount of shock load that the person feels. The, it turns out that we actually crashed an airliner, and I worked on this one. We had a Boeing 720, four-engine airliner. We remote controlled the airplane, fully instrumented it, and we crashed it into the lake bed. It caught fire. It wasn't supposed to catch fire. That was one of the things we were testing was a, a, a fuel that would not burn, anti-misting kerosene. And it turns out that the experiment failed in that way. And that was the immediate reaction everyone had when, when we did this in 1984, that, that this failure was, was an indication that NASA and our partners who, who were doing this experiment with us, we had failed in the experiment. But one of the things we learned was we, we had a bunch of crash test dummies that we had loaded in the airplane. And we discovered that the seats were way too strong Afterwards, you walk up and down the aisle, the seats were still fine, but the crash test dummy said the loads that that would have imparted on a human would have broken legs, pelvis, and back on many of the people in what was a survivable crash. And so seats are now designed to absorb that energy. And it was part of the reason that we got that data that, that came out. And so there are a number of things that people are not aware of that they take advantage of every day. How, how many hundreds of thousands, millions of people are sitting in airline seats today, let's say, and, and don't even realize that the seats that they're in are far safer than the seats that I flew in when I was a kid. And, and we just don't have that realization. Those are the kinds of things that I, I'm very proud to say NASA figures those things out. And, and they benefit people like you and I every day that, that don't even realize it. It's interesting. It's, in a way, it's kind of redefining the idea of failure because even if the initial concept fails, through that failure, you actually may discover things you never anticipated you'd find. Yes, many, many times. And mm -hmm. fa failures like that help us to understand things much, much better. And it, it, we do spend a lot of time thinking about, well, if this doesn't work or that doesn't work, and inevitably it's the thing you don't think about that ends up, you know, biting you in the backside and, and causes a failure. And so you don't end up succeeding in what you were trying to do. And, and also I think for NASA and for kids, it's also the, the inspiration and the wonder. Oh, yeah. The, 
I, I had the opportunity to meet about half of the guys that walked on the moon um, during my career. And every single time, I mean, I, I was tongue tied as to what the to, one thing I, I was cautioned about was do not ask Neil Armstrong about landing on the moon. <laughs> that he, he didn't want to talk about landing on the moon. He wanted to talk about the airplane he flew last weekend. Oh, interesting. And, and he loved flying airplanes. That was his thing. And so you, that's what you talked to Neil about. It, it was just one of those things. Buzz Aldrin was, was much more cerebral. He wanted to talk about what, what's the science, what, what's the payoff, what's the benefit. And he also has a vision for, this is why he's always talking about Mars. And we need to be going to Mars. This, and I understand why he says that. I understand why he has a very singular focus about that. And I'm glad that he's the one that's running off his mouth doing that. Buzz is great. He's awesome. And, and I appreciate every time I have an opportunity to interact with him. And, but those, those things capture people's imagination. And fortunately, many of them use that as a platform. The other guys that have walked on the moon that, that are still around, there's only four of them right now that have walked on the moon. Still, out of the 12, there's only four left. And um, the other three don't talk about it much. And I wish they would because there, there are many generations since they actually walked on the moon that have come. And sure, they've seen the photos, they've read the history books, but they haven't heard the stories. And there, there's something just unbelievably that it, it, it's so different to hear the stories and how much more involved you become with the story when you hear the story coming from the person who was there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's truly an amazing thing. Now, Al, as we're speaking, we just got news that NASA just landed a rover on Mars, and I'm curious what you see as the significance of this. The rovers capture people's imagination. Um, we, we drive cars all the time, Americans. It's an American thing, right? And so people have this image of a rover just being like a car. And in fact, the, the rover that was just landed on Mars is about the size of a, a Mini Cooper. They, people have used that analogy many, many times. So if you can imagine a Mini Cooper um, swinging underneath a, a rocket platform on, on the set of cables being set down on Mars, that's, that's about what just happened. And it captures people's imagination, kids in particular, that that here's this device that's going to be driving around on Mars for a couple of years, maybe longer, uh, maybe several years. Um, and it just arrived on Mars and we'll start getting images back. They've also got a, a helicopter. Uh, some of my friends actually were on the helicopter team. And uh, how do you develop a helicopter to fly on Mars? The atmosphere is so thin and it turns out drone technology allows you to do that. And this is a case of commercial products actually influencing state-of-the-art stuff that's going on elsewhere. And, and so that, that capability has now gone to Mars. Um, we have a joke at NASA uh, about Mars. Mars is the only planet that's completely populated by robots. And, and, uh, but it, it captures people's imaginations in ways that um, many of the other things don't. The moon, when we went to the moon, we had six successes out of seven tries. Uh, Apollo 13, of course, did not land. People viewed that as, well, it must be too easy. It must have been too easy a target. The moon was really, really hard. It, it, was, it was a very difficult thing to go there. In the time frame that, that they had, uh, John F. Kennedy gave them a little over eight years in order to be able to do that. Mars is a different sort of a problem. It's much, much harder. And going there, there's a, you're, you're truly cutting your ties to Earth. If someone had a, a burst appendix or something on a trip to the moon, if that had happened, there are things you could have done in order to get that person back to the Earth and for them to survive. 
Going to Mars is a different story. If someone develops cancer, someone has a, a burst appendix, someone has a stroke, those kinds of issues are going to be huge problems. And it would not surprise me in the least if a medical doctor was one of the members uh, on every mission that was going to Mars, simply because of that fact. And, and that the medical supplies, I'm sure, are going to be a couple of orders of magnitude more in the kits that go to Mars compared to what we did going to the moon. Hmm. So, but the, there's something, it's a little bit like thinking about Magellan setting out for three years. Going, going to the Mars is like that. And we're going to have to have that sort of a mindset for the, the explorers that go and do that. It's going to be a very, very different thing. Now, Al, just last question here. You know, again, we were talking earlier about, you know, China's, of course, talking about mining the moon. You have SpaceX talking about, you know, commercial space flights. NASA is still very much focused on pushing the frontier. And I guess just if you were to tell people one thing, you know, what do you see the value in the idea of pushing that frontier? You're asking an old guy, right? And, and for me, my career is over. Um, that doesn't mean I still don't think about it. And, and the students still call me up all the time. It's the young people firing the imaginations of the young people doing these things because there, there are other places for them to go, other things for them to do. And those goals are still out there for these young people. And this is where I'm going to enjoy my retirement immensely, watching what these young people do. And each time something like that happens, there's a huge amount of pride that I feel in, in what the agency does. There's a, the, the, the agency, when you, when you retire from the agency, it's a typical government organization in, in many ways, okay? And there are a lot of things the government does that are great, but it, sometimes the way the, the, the sausage gets made isn't so, so pleasant along the way. And certainly there are things that NASA could do better but NASA is one of the gold standards that the, the, the government holds up as this is what all of the government should be like. The, the dedication of the people, the, the hard work, the determination, the, the imagination that's used in, in what they do. And, and the young people can see that and they want to be a part of that. They want to have a piece of that that, hey, I was a part of that. Um, and, and it, it's an awesome thing. And just to have seen that in some of the students that I interacted with, and then the places where they've gone off to. Three, three of my interns are working for SpaceX. So every time there's a SpaceX launch, I know some of the things that they touched are on that rocket. And, and in, in an odd sort of way, that means I had a part of that as well. In, in, in getting those students just that experience and that imagination and the drive in order to be able to do those things. Mm -hmm. And I have three or four students that want to go work at JPL. I get that. We would, we would go down and tour at JPL and I knew every single time that I would lose three or four of them. Every single time we would go down there. The last time we went down was about uh, two and a half years ago. And the rocket motor that just put Perseverance on the surface of, of Mars, I saw that thing setting on the, on the, the high bay floor in the, in the white room. And we were in the, the observation deck. And all these students are standing there and they're asking me, what is that? Is that a, a, an engineering mock-up? Or I'm going, no. That is hardware that's going to end up on the surface of Mars. And there was a, this, you know, they're, they're like little kids with their fingers on the wall in the, <laughs> up, up against the glass just watching. And I understood exactly where they were because that was me once upon a time. And it was so cool to see them captivated by that. And I hope a few of them are eloquent enough to go back and talk about why that's important to them, that maybe somebody else might understand a little bit more why NASA exists. Hey, Al, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thanks.